Okay, I see Marta is here. Hello, good morning. Uh, I think we should slowly begin. Uh, so good morning to everyone again. I hope you hear me well. Um, welcome to the fourth Irene uh, workshop, this time dedicated to oral history, in particular to the aspects of trauma and border. Uh, it will uh, speak or to us how oral history can add to observation and interpretation of border realities and how trauma, which is also often a part of these border realities, can be explored not only in aspects how it affects the observed subjects, so the traumatized population, but also how, it's, how it affects us, oral historians and researchers of this, um, um, these aspects. So in this regard, I would like to greet cordially our presenters, our speakers who showed um, willingness to cooperate with us and also a great deal of self-initiative in setting up the program. Uh, well, this I have to say that this workshop was initially planned for the notorious 2020, we planned it in June, but we had to postpone um, this uh, event um, due to the uncertainty of this pandemic situation. Uh, it is also planned shorter, not only online, because uh, we believe that, uh, I mean, I believe that online events turn out to be quite exhausting. And the last thing is, to make you overly exhausted. But online event also enables uh, other people who would not be able to join us from other parts of Europe and the world to join us. So, uh, but in these terms, I would also like to, to address one other idea, which is actually related to the oral history as a method and that is its interactive, interactive nature. So oral history is a method where interpersonal contacts are crucial. And in this regard, I would also like to cordially um, greet everyone who's listening, who, who is only uh, um, watching us, who registers, uh, who registered to, to see what's going on on this workshop. Uh, and I would like to stimulate all of you who are present here to add to our workshop, whether by setting questions or by commenting or by opening new angles. Uh, and your involvement is highly appreciated. I would like to also emphasize that this event is being recorded but uh, we still need to get your permission to put it online after it. Uh, so this is something we will handle, handle afterwards. And to conclude, uh, I would like to thank to all of you who contributed to the creation of this, um, to this workshop, in particular, Marta uh, Virginella, um, Colonna Kaplar and Neja Tardin. Uh, and maybe it's time just to pass the word on to Marta Virginella, who is the PI of this project and also initiated many ideas and also speakers for this workshop. Please, Marta, the word is yours. We can't hear you, Marta. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, thank you, Ushka. Hvala. Uh, good, morning to, good morning to everyone. Welcome and thank you uh, for being here with us. First of all, I would like to thank Urška Sterle, who took over the main part of the organization of this uh, workshop and all the participants who accepted uh, our invitation. At the time, 
when the number of Zoom events uh, is quite bulimic. I believe many of you would rather spend this morning uh, differently. Uh, I, in short, thank you for being here with us and thank you for being to share your knowledge and experience with the um, <clears throat> Irene uh, IRC project team. Our project uh, focuses on the female population in 20th century post-war periods in the Northern Adriatic region. And for our topic, the choice of oral history and the acquisition of oral resources was self-evident for several reasons. It is now that the female population has historically left behind fewer documentary resources than the male which remains true also for the 20th century, despite increased literacy, education, and professional independence of many women. The post-war periods, due to their groundbreaking, groundbreaking and traumatic war experiences, encouraged the writing of many women, especially where border mobility was changed, changed by national affiliations. In the wider region, which we are exploring, this happened after the First World War, with the disintegration of the Habsburg monarchy, either on the Italian Yugoslav or on the Austrian Yugoslav border and the Hungarian Yugoslav border, or in the former Austrian littoral, in Italian Julian, in Venezia Giulia, Carinzia, Koroshka, and Prekmurje. After the Second World War, it is mainly in the area of Julian March, but also in other border areas over a longer period. The same happened to Carinzia, Koroshka, where the border had all the characteristics of the Iron Curtain, and in Prekmurje, where the Informiro resolution suppressed post war cooperation between Hungary and Yugoslavia countries that after 1945 belong to the same ideological bloc. There are always too few memory sources and other autobiographical records of women and historical actors to be able to capture the diversity of their experiences in the context of post-war events, or in other words, to penetrate their subjectivity to bring the general closer to the individual. In addition to the delay and sporadic use of oral history in the geographical areas of our interest, it is also worth mentioning the reluctance that Slovene and similar Croatian historiography has cultivated for too long. Too long. Today, we have studies that confirm the importance of the historiographical use of oral sources, especially female, in the research of other border areas. I'm referring to studies carried out uh, by Martina Orechovets, Vida Rojats, Darovets, Brut, uh, Boris Brumen, Natasha Rogelia, and others, as well as those carried out in the Gorishka, Gorizia, and Koroshka, Karinzia regions. They highlight women crossing the border even during the most severe tightening of frontier controls and testify to the women's ability to loosen and weaken the borders. But consol consolidating or softening geopolitical borders does not as a rule depend solely on the political and economic interest of political centers. It can also be pursued by border peripheries and border communities living on them which do not necessarily have a common understanding of obstacle to the movement of people and goods at the borders. Women only played a very important role in its softening. If it's true that borders, as Julie Mosto explains, are only institution of control, places of discrimination, areas of detention and identity verification, then it should be added that there 
are also places of opportunities to increase prosperity in the border region. It is no coincidence that domestic work and small scale, uh, scale illegal trading direct, directs our research towards cleaners and women from the countryside to try to research them over a long period of time. The, stu stu the study of the oral testimonies of maids and smugglers provides reasons for crossing the demarcation line between zone A and zone B of the Julian uh, region. And later the, later the Italian Yugoslav state border, which, which took place during the strictest policy control of flu of people and goods. It is no coincidence that crossing the borders has been associated with the gray economy and inform us of the ways people increase prosperity in the border world. It should not be forgotten that in Slovenian transition phase after 1991, a part of the dismissed female labor force in the factories merged into the gray segment. Therefore, if we take a closer look at the phenomena of domestic work, workers in the Primorska border region, we find that this segment of the female wor uh, workforce is located in the interspace of normative systems. After the end of the Second World War, it was found in the niches of the gray economy, which coexisted with a socialist society and which certainly remained easier and longer in the social periphery and in the border regions. Women who, despite their lower education and without professional specialization, still earned about as much or even more than their fellow citizens with secondary or higher education. This was due to differences in border economic systems and standards in the mid 1990s and the women assessed their activity as economically important. They valued it positively, thus increasing their sense of self-confidence. Asked by the researcher whether her interlocutor was satisfied with the illegally paid housework, housework, the informant replied, I quote, yes, I am satisfied. I am satisfied because I am alone in all the houses. I have this key to the house. They trust me. I am going, I know what I have to do. I do my job. No one checks me well. If it wasn't right, they would have told me, but they haven't. Practical work is diverse and I like it. It's freedom for me. If I need a day of day, also give it to me. No problem, but yes, no. If you get sick, then you don't get paid. No, you get paid for what you do. I like that I have a varied job because when I worked in a factory in common, I sewed one and the same sleeve for a few hours. It was a fool. Here, you finish one job first, then you go and dry the racks. Then something else, something new always happens, but it's, but it's okay for me, uh, end of quotation. Informants about the domestic work they do for a fee believe that it, that it allows them a sphere of autonomous action, if not complete economic independence. The work they do unpaid at home, it's done to push them into the tra traditional role of economically and social subordinate women. It is about value and paid domestic, valuing uh, uh, and pay domestic work, which we can only understand if we listen to their understanding of the work, if we get in touch with them and listen to their narrative. In our project, we are also interested in other segments of the female population, refugees, camp, uh, inmates, intellectuals, teachers, and others. Now, I don't have time to speak about them. 
I add only that it's important to evaluate their personal experiences as well as collective ones, and we attempt to understand which place they occupy in the memorial wars, uh, which especially shake the Slovenian and Croatian space, and also in the border areas in general. Thank you for your attention.